Tiffany Garcia Dresser is a lifelong Texan, went to the University of Houston Clear Lake for her degree in special ed, K through 12, as a biology minor. She reports that she had a strong memory of a trip to the Grand Canyon with her mother when she was only nine years old. She cites this as the time she became interested in all things outdoors. This lasting impression helped inform her choices that she's made ever since. She and her husband love to travel and backpack for extended periods into remote national parks and forests. She maintains a home, butterfly, house, and vegetable garden. She describes herself as a passionate educator who has participated in education curriculum training in CCISD for years. She assisted in building and designing habitats for outdoor learning for teachers and students both. She is currently teaching environmental science at CCISD. She teaches gifted and talented as well as special needs students. She uses many native plants and trees at the school sites and led many field trips to allow them to experience plants and trees, et cetera, in their natural setting. With our new grant program and outreach emphasis for youth projects, we welcome Tiffany and her sharing her ideas and tips in engaging and keeping youth interest in our natural world. Welcome, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Wow, that was an amazing introduction. Some of that stuff I kind of forgot about myself, but <laughs> thanks for uh, letting me remember all that. Here's my intro picture. And as you can see, really the spotlight is about my grandson because we now have an 11 month old grandson and it is so exciting kind of reliving that, taking the baby outdoors and all of the exploration and everything being just like so new and exciting which is kind of what I try to get with, with my kids at school, but we know how, how babies are, right? Everything is just so amazing. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about how I work on engaging kids and conservation and appreciation of nature. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the things I've done and experienced, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. All right, so I just kind of wanna to talk to you a little bit about the, the hats that I wear. Um, I'm a mom of two. I have a son and a daughter. They are both in their 20s. I'm a yaya, which, you know, I'm a grandma, but I go by yaya. I do teach uh, science classes at Westbrook Intermediate School to gifted and talented students. And then I also am an environmental education teacher, as well as a track coach. I backcountry hike with my husband. Um, we try to go as much as possible. And um, I love to garden. I try to spend as much time as possible there. So uh, one of the things that's always really funny is when I talk to my um, students at school, uh, I tell them about the things that I used to experience as a kid and how being inside was basically like a punishment. You know, where I grew up, which is actually around here, I went to Whitcomb Elementary as a kid. So just right around the corner. But I remember that when we came home from school, you weren't allowed to be inside, right? So you were like kicked out. You had to make sure that you came in as it was getting dark. You had to be in far enough reach. So if your mom like whistled or screamed, you could hear her and then come on in. So, you know, shooting marbles, riding bikes, playing jacks, going to the neighbor's water hose and just drinking out of it. So a lot of times I share these experiences with my um, middle schoolers. And they literally look at me like I have lost my mind. They are like, that's so gross. Uh, how could you drink out of that? Like, weren't you sweaty? What did you, you know, how did you do this? How'd you do that? And I was like, well, you know, we spend most of our time with our creativity, with our imagination. We didn't have anything telling us what we needed to look at or think or see, you know, digging holes in the ground and uh, making taking clay, right? Good old Texas gumbo, taking clay and making little things on them dry out. So uh, it's really fun to share those things with the kids because they're pretty far removed from it and they don't realize how much as kids we were connected to nature. So there I am hiking the Grand Canyon when I was about nine years old. I will say that that the picture cracks me up uh, every time I see it because I am just like so proud, happy, happy, happy. And I definitely remember times in this canyon where I was just like so tired and so hot and so miserable. But I love that this picture was captured that made it look like, oh, it was just all perfectly fun. 
So I did hike the Grand Canyon uh, with my mom when I was nine. I have since been back to the Grand Canyon a couple times. I actually met my husband at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And then we took an anniversary trip and we hiked rim to rim. So it is a very special place for me with so many amazing things and amazing memories. And then there I am over there going on some trails in the snow. So my, my mom had me outdoors a lot. She was a science teacher uh, as well. And my dad was a college professor and a basketball coach. So um, I kind of had the best of both worlds, really. It was a, a really great kind of outdoor experience as a kid. I'm kind of briefly kind of talk to you about the personal benefits that, that I get, which I know that you guys know because you spend time outside and, and you love to garden. But my husband and I, we, we take as many backcountry trips as possible. And we will put whatever we need on our back for days at a time. And when we go out, you know, there's no electricity. There's running water, but not really for the sake of like filling up, you know, a toilet or, you know, through a water fountain. So these are all natural sources. So the greatest thing for me is there's, you know, there's no signals there, right? There's no access to um, cell phones and there's no distractions. And I, I really reap a lot of mental health benefits from being in these places. And as crazy as it sounds, the fact that I get to like hear myself think and actually have conversations with myself, right? So it's, a, it's an amazing time for, for you to like uh, be able to process all of those things that a lot of times when we're very busy or we're distracted, we kind of compartmentalize and we don't address. And so we know the research shows how beneficial being outdoors is to our mental health. But specifically for me, I know that it has done so many great things for my mental health, just being able to be out um, in nature and really connecting with it like this. So I'm not sure if you guys know of Last Child in the Woods. I'm sure many of you know, but um, I really love this quote from Louvre. Uh, we have such a brief opportunity to pass on to our children our love of the earth and to tell our stories. And these are the moments when the world is made whole. And in my children's memories, the adventures we've had together in nature will always exist. So when my kids were really young, I tried to take them to a lot of places when they were young and just explore, even in the backyard. They could basically do, the, do what I did, like dig holes and, and pick grasses and, and all those kinds of things. Just a lot of exploration. So when they were really young, uh, they had a lot of outdoor experience. We lived on two acres and um, my son would actually like build ramps where he would jump them into, into the pond and then he tied a rope on so he could, you know, pull it out and jump again. And, you know, they would catch bullfrogs and all those kinds of things. So I, I am really glad that I had got that experience, that outdoor experience so that I could pass that on and understand the love of nature with my children. So you can see in the top corner, that's me and my little guy. We actually live on Exploration Green. So we have so many great opportunities to be um, out there in the back and kind of walk around and explore. And um, he definitely helps me a lot in my garden. So there he is giving me a hand with the dirt. And there's my son. I took my son hiking um, into the Grand Canyon when he was 16. So that was a really amazing experience in a way for me to not only connect with my son, but also with nature. And then there's my daughter. We took her and, and the little guy to Idaho. And uh, he actually uh, was on a little front pack with his dad when we hiked in those areas. And then there's my daughter jumping off into Crater Lake. So just the fact that I have been able to expose my kids to so many things has really um, impacted them. My daughter actually uh, started her own sustainable dog business on her own. So she sells um, sustainable um, and eco-friendly like dog treats and dog toys and bandanas. So the fact that I was able to expose her to those things and kind of show her how important it is to have that relationship with nature kind of made a difference for her when she got older. And my son actually works for an eco or environmentally friendly uh, pest control place. So he is always, you know, very kind of happy to know that he's not using a lot of chemicals 
that can be extremely harmful because we we have conversations about it. So it's it's really nice to know that those influences made a difference for them as adults. So this is kind of something that, you know, this this quote that you can read by Tristan Harris from a show called The Social Dilemma. And basically it's, you know, the kids nowadays when they're uncomfortable or lonely or, or uncertain or, you know, the first thing they do is they want to grab their phone. And I see even people my age or older, they're now kind of using the, the digital pacifier as they call it. And for teachers, we're up against these things. We're up against almost every kid having cell phones um, on them. Very, very young kids are having cell phones. I mean, you guys probably have seen even babies having devices when they go out to eat or even in their stroller. So there is uh, a disconnect that we are kind of up against in this generation, this young generation and the one coming up as well. So for me, uh, as a middle school teacher, one of the things that I really, really want to do is if you expose them to something new and amazing, they won't really feel that need to be on that device. So every time I take kids out and they are interacting with nature in this way, they're not grabbing uh, for their phone, which is really a, an amazing and beautiful thing to see. So for example, here, I said, you know, children don't really want their phones. They don't really crave their devices when they're in nature and they're discovering new things. I mean, I, even as adults, right, when we come across something new or beautiful uh, that we've discovered, I mean, maybe taking a picture, but other than that, uh, we really don't want to be distracted. We want to be kind of looking at what's going on. So you know, a couple of things here is uh, we've taken groups out to do sweep netting. Uh, I've taken small groups to do some kayaking um, with artist boat, uh, taking kids over this far picture is I took a group of kids to Armin Bayou uh, and we saw the broad banded water snakes and they were absolutely amazed. Uh, they stayed there for a really long time, just kind of watching the snakes move around. So again, the exposure of taking kids out into nature and showing them how connected they are and how exciting it can be really helps with trying to, to fight or interact with those devices. So here's just some other things that I, I wanted to share with you guys of when the kids are out, how kind of entranced they are with nature and um, what they're doing. It's, it's really, really exciting to come up with these plans for the kids to go out. This has been a really tough year for everyone. Uh, in my class in particular, we take four field trips a year. Um, I got my bus driving license years ago. I mean, I coach, but mostly because I wanted to take kids out into the community and out to different like nature parks and different ecosystems. So the picture that you see on the left, we actually are, uh, Westbrook Intermediate has this big field behind it. And so I take kids out to sweep net. Uh, they were super excited about that, had never used, you know, net before, and then they were looking at the insects. We harvest mushrooms, and we do spore prints, uh, and they're all, like I said, every time they're fascinated uh, with things that they're not used to seeing. So even, I'll give an example, even yesterday, I had kids running up to me with empty snail shells that they had found in the garden because we're, we're transitioning. A lot of our stuff died in the freeze that we had planted. Um, so we are uh, kind of turning over our garden right now. And so they'll run up and, you know, grub worms and earthworms and these snails, uh, they're very excited to show me what's going on, even though they're, you know, 12, 13, 14, kind of that age where they're a little too cool to want to kind of talk to an adult or hang out with an adult. They're very excited to kind of show me what they found. Here's just some things that we've done. They planted, we've turned a, um, we've turned basically a, a whole area that was just San Augustine into an amazing schoolyard habitat. So I'll show you some pictures in a minute of that, but, but it's really a beautiful thing to see. So the other thing that I, that I try to tell people when they, you know, when they want to work with kids or I have reached out to groups to try to get them to come to the school and work with the kids. Sorry, the one picture of there isn't very clear. First of all, middle schoolers scare people. 
Um, and I, I get it. I understand why, right? Because it's such, uh, it, it's definitely a transitional stage, which comes with a big range of emotions. But I adore this age group. They're so fun. They're kind of in that phase where they want independence, but they also want you to like recognize them and they want to make connections with you. And what I tell people is like, they just, they just want you to be there, right? They want you to listen to them so you don't have to be an expert. Um, and I find out on the regular how much I am not an expert, um, which is great because then we understand that we're learning together. And I think the beauty of that is when you show children your vulnerability, that you don't know everything, that you don't always have the answer, and that you can work to find out that information together, it brings you closer together. It really connects you with the kids. So um, this picture on the left, which, sorry, it's, it's not clear. Thought it was going to be better than that, but we were actually um, doing a campus cleanup. So we would walk around the campus, we pick up, you know, any litter or whatever. And some students came across this plant on the ground, and we had never seen it before on this campus. I mean, I've been on this campus for 15 years, and I had never seen this plant. And they were like, "Oh my gosh, what is this?" Because of course, since I'm their teacher, I should know every living thing, right, on the entire campus. I should know all the names of all the plants and all of the animals and all of the birds. So it's kind of funny um, when they ask me a lot, you know, what is this? What is that? I'm like, I don't know, but you know what? I have a field guide or let's, you know, let's look it up. So what was really interesting is that we came back in and we started looking at what was going on with this plant. And I actually put it on a, a site on Facebook and immediately got some um, expert advice. But this is a carnivorous plant called the sundew. So the kids were so fired up and so excited that we had a carnivorous plant on our campus. Uh, and we later found out that Texas has four of the five um, carnivorous plants. So that was something that was very exciting. We talked about the adaptations and we talked about where it grew and why it grew there. So it was really an amazing moment. And then I took out some of my other classes uh, to see if we could find it and, and kind of look at it. Uh, this next picture is a skull that we found while kind of just walking in one day from a little mini field trip that we took. Uh, we had no idea what it was, but we used a dichotomous key and came across the answer together. And we found out that uh, it was a juvenile raccoon. Okay, so we did a couple of things, right? We, we learned using the dichotomous key and we both found out something together. And the last picture is just documentation, you know, sometimes just going out and, and writing down colors and finding out what things look like and smell like and feel like. Those are all uh, those sensory experiences that we crave and that we need to all have. I really love this last picture, though, because we had the uh, black swallowtails and they were on the Turks cap and it was just like this really amazing moment. The kids get really excited, uh, but the funny thing, that this has a really funny story, well, funny and sad, but uh, it's the circle of life. So this particular black swallowtail had just hatched in a, a butterfly house that I had brought to school. And so I think there was a couple of them. So we took them outside and the kids were so excited. And I said, okay, well, you know, let's put it over here in the butterfly garden. Uh, so we put it on the Turks cap and the kids were watching it and, you know, documenting the behavior and those kinds of things. So all of a sudden the, the butterfly, I mean, like I said, just released it. The butterfly lifted up to take off and a dragonfly swooped in and grabbed it and started to eat it. And, you know, this all happened in front of the kids. So it was like, oh my gosh, we just released this beautiful butterfly and immediately, right? Like it was attacked by a dragonfly and eaten. But it was just this amazing experience that the kids got to witness that they normally wouldn't have if they didn't have access or exposure to this environment. So um, it didn't end well for the, for the butterfly, but definitely was something really, really amazing for the kids to be able to see. Looking at this quote about small groups and how impactful they can be, your particular chapter uh, even though you're a small group, you probably do some really amazing things and impact a lot of people in the community. And so no matter how small the group of kids are that I have, sometimes I teach many courses and, and my groups are, you know, anywhere from 20 to 25. 
Um, sometimes my environmental ed, ed classes are anywhere between 14 to 30 kids. Sometimes I'll be able to take um, my whole seventh grade uh, group out, which can be anywhere between 150 to uh, up to 200 kids um, at a time. So just kind of understanding that that small group is able to do amazing things and change the world a little at a time, okay? And, and even though they're middle schoolers and seem a little bit crazy, they really, really can do some, some really fabulous things. And the fact that I continue to tell them, you are impacting the world right now. So here we are, we had harvested some marsh cord grass. We were doing a uh, project with uh, Galveston Bay Foundation. And later on in the year, a different class took these marsh grasses out and we planted them into an area that was dealing with a lot of erosion. So ultimately, we were very impactful in the local community. So one of the things that I really work on doing is trying to have outreach with other groups. So for example, Texas City Prayer Preserve, I've taken quite a few uh, groups over there, some very small groups. And I actually, for I think about three or four years, I took uh, the whole seventh grade GT class out there and we had rotations and uh, the Galveston Bay Master Naturalists were a great source that came out and helped run the stations. And, and we did bird watching and prairie planting and uh, marsh restoration. Again, the kids at first were like, oh gosh, it's muddy and my shoes are wet. And, you know, and by the time they got in there with those dibble tools and started getting wet, I could barely drag them out. They had so much fun. We had a lot of pushback at first about going on these trips because, you know, they're not used to it. There's bugs and it's hot and it's wet. And, I, you know, what about my shoes? They're going to get muddy. And then by the time we did the rotation, they were like, we don't want to leave. That was a great trip. And it really not only makes my heart full, but I understand like that memory will be with them. It will stay with them and can hopefully impact uh, their future in conservation. Like this other picture, I took a small group to Galveston Island and we did some dune restoration. Um, we have worked with Armin Bayou and uh, worked out in the field and uh, also planted some prairie grasses. And then that last picture over there, this was at Pine Gully. We, we actually did a lot, a lot of work uh, at Pine Gully. I think I took kids over to Pine Gully Park, you know, kind of at the end over there behind Moss. I took probably four or five years over there uh, to Pine Gully and so much work got done. Uh, they, they did have a couple of groups, we, but we had a lot of work get done over there. And uh, they finally closed it off because they had enough marsh grasses planted and they were reproducing. So it's really neat to go because sometimes I, I go over there to Pine Gully and I walk on that boardwalk and I look out across there and it makes me feel so amazing to know that kids were out there and did a majority of that planting, that they were a part of the history of that area of restoring, of conservation. That's something that you never can replace. And it's something that, you know, even though you take pictures and video, you can't really capture, right? Because it's because it's very emotional. So recently, the groups, not this year, unfortunately, uh, because of the pandemic, we have not been able to take our trips. Usually we take about four trips a year. And one of the trips that we've started taking is a trip to Exploration Green. Uh, and one of the things that we're starting to do is uh, work in the wetland plant nursery. So we have kids uh, doing work there, doing some replanting, taking, taking plants out of the water sources, getting invasives out. So you can see in that bottom picture, I got kids in there that are removing some invasive snail eggs that were over there in Exploration Green. So that was kind of an eye opener for them to be participating in removing snail pink, bright pink snail eggs uh, in Exploration Green. And then taking kids out to uh, initially harvest cord grass so that we, we were a nursery site for many years and we would grow and, and they would use, uh, learn how to use refractometers and be able to adjust salinity values and really, really keep up 
with the plants before they, they went out and planted them in whatever area was in the biggest need. And then, of course, there we are down at the bottom um, throwing seed balls that we had created into the prairie um, out there. So that was, that was really fun, too. Other things that are very impactful. So, so if you think about it, like these kids are anywhere between 11 to 14. It's about the age group that, uh, age group that I work with. Um, and these kids are in community service, okay? And for them, it doesn't feel like one of those types of things because they're having fun, but continuing to let them know that they are connected to nature and connected to uh, community is something that is really, really impactful. And these kids are in middle, middle school, so they're not as worried. I know when they get into high school, they get very worried about collecting those hours for you know, NHS and college, uh, their resumes and things like that. But here we have an opportunity just to say, you know what, this is not our time to get something back, right? So it isn't always something like, well, if I do this, then I need to, I need to have something in return. So this age group is, is really perfect for that. So we have kids doing oyster reef restoration, um, actually cleaning uh, around the shoreline in the bay, and of course, taking out the, the marsh grass uh, to get it planted. This is our campus and the picture, the far picture on the right um, actually was probably taken maybe a year or two ago. So it's actually grown a lot more than that. But when I first started working at Westbrook, this was the habitat on the left. So there was nothing there but San Augustine grass. And um, I mean, you can imagine it was um, smoldering hot. Uh, out there, just direct sun. And I started a class the very next year, just a, just a mini course, we call them. Uh, and these kids were working on designing a habitat. And of course, uh, we got very excited and our vision was much more than we had money for or approval for from the, the school board at the time. So uh, the group down at the bottom was one of my very first classes. So I, I went to the school board and I said, you know, we, we have a need for an environmental education class in CCISD. And, and this class is the only one that's taught in the, in the entire district, um, environmental education. There are um, science-based classrooms at, at other campuses, but uh, this one is the only environmental education course in all of CCISD. So this is one of my groups at the bottom. This was our very first garden bed that we put in. And you can see some of the smaller plants around. We have four wax myrtles that are out on the campus now, and they uh, reach above the building. So um, it's grown a lot. And it's really amazing to, to know that basically six through eighth graders um, have built this place from the bottom up. Okay. They dug holes, they put plants in, you know, they sometimes dug holes that weren't uh, sufficient. And sometimes we planted the plants the wrong way, but uh, we learned from it and we made something together that was absolutely amazing. I have had opportunities uh, from groups to come out and help me. So I've had um, groups the Galveston Bay Master Naturalists have come out. Jim Duran from uh, Galveston Bay has come out and done a lot of work with us on uh, establishing our prairies. Jaime Gonzalez from, well, he's with Nature Conservancy now, but originally with uh, KPC, Katy Prairie Conservancy, has done a lot of help. Sheila Brown, I can't even begin to tell you how much that this woman has uh, given me a push and uh, really kind of strengthened me up to go in and fight for fight for the cause of outdoor education. We've done work at EIH. So uh, the community has been really good to me and to the kids to, to get a lot of things established. So this is a really great quote, looking at how experiencing these natural environments not only makes us healthier, but more creative. It helps with mental uh, stress, anxiety. There's so many studies out there for all the benefits. But the beauty is, is that it also encourages empathy, which is really an amazing thing. And which is what kind of led me to uh, writing a grant in the district. So this is um, these pictures over here. I worked with a group of autistic children 
And a friend of mine was their teacher. So she said, you know, I really want to get these kids involved in outdoor activities, all the research shows, all these studies. So I designed a little course for a week and we got the kids out there and it was absolutely amazing. You know, nature also gives us empathy for not only the environment, but for other people, which is, which is something that, you know, we need across our community and our world. So this leads me to kind of talking to you about the grant. So I wrote a grant a few years ago uh, for the school district. And the, what the grant involved was outdoor habitats and special needs groups. So with that, with the money that I received for the um, CCISD grant, basically I took over an atrium at Clearbrook High School. So you can see at the bottom, um, I call it Jumanji. Uh, it was just an absolute disaster. And I remember like the first time I walked out there and I was like, what did I get myself into? Like, I I'm not sure what I think I'm going to do with this. And, you know, I definitely bit off more than I could chew at the time. But once I started getting kids involved, it just got much easier. They were very excited. Uh, they were invested. So you can see over here on the left that uh, we transformed and are continuing to transform this atrium into a place where not only the high school students can be, but also our AA class, our alternate academics class can come out and enjoy. We planted a lot of natives. We have stuff that isn't native because a lot of things were donated and we do have limited funds, but the involvement of the kids was unbelievable. And you can see uh, back here, these are high schoolers that I actually taught when they were in middle school. And it was so amazing to, to see the impact because a lot of times as teachers, we don't get to see that. You know, we, we have the kids for nine months and we, make, we try to make connections and we love them and we care for them. And we, we try to be impactful while also making sure what the, to do what the state is asking us to do. But what happened was I started an eco club for a couple of years. And then the kids leave, right? So they went to the high school and there was not an eco club there and they started their own eco club. And I was so thrilled, again, heart full. And um, there, were, there were probably like 30 members of their uh, high school eco club. So it was, it was just an amazing thing. They're, they're wanting to do a lot of community service and really kind of keep up with this atrium. And then the far picture on the right is we, we have a recycling program at school and my environmental education class runs the program. And what we do is, is our students work with our um, alternate academics class, our special needs class, and we do the recycling for the campus. So we pick up all paper for all teachers classrooms, uh, for all rooms, administration and office and stuff too, as well as plastic and aluminum. So we work together and, and we bond as a school group and as a school community. Uh, so being outdoors, conservation uh, lends itself to empathy for other humans as well. So this is part of the program. These are some things that we have done as part of the program. We build beds for the special needs classes and we go out and we work with them and, and we plant vegetables and, and uh, butterfly gardens. Over here, this was at uh, Weber Elementary, their feeder school. So we started building beds over there. We uh, usually in a, in a non-pandemic year when we can take trips, the last nine weeks we take our AA class, uh, we usually take them over to Froberg and we do strawberry picking and we walk around the garden and, and kind of look at those things. And then sometimes we'll just, we'll just go out and wonder, we'll just find things. Uh, but this particular one, we had picked a couple um, wildflowers, which I know picking the wildflowers, but we picked a couple and we pressed them um, and looked at their parts. And then we, in, we made a couple cards for our special needs classes. So again, just encouraging tolerance, patience, empathy through nature. I think we know how... Uh, children are attracted to dirt and water for sure. I know that my grandson is and my kids most definitely were. And I was never the parent uh, that was really worried about like stains on the shirt or the pants or things like that. Sometimes I'm up against that at school because, you know, kids will come with their fancy 
and somewhat expensive shoes or, you know, white shirts or things like that. So they're sometimes very hesitant to kind of get into the garden beds or the dirt to, you know, help out uh, with gardening, but they tend to get over it really, really quickly once they get out there and they kind of get their hands dirty and start realizing what their impact is. Um, so this is just a group that I took to the newer, um, so Galveston Bay Foundation bought some land off of 146 and this is us out there doing some sleep netting and using um, field guides to try to figure out what we had caught. So let me tell you a little bit about this article. Um, actually, right before I got on to practice with Debbie, this National Geographic article came across uh, my email and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so perfect and appropriate. So basically this author talks about when she was young, like she was very, very into nature, but we kind of, as, as kids, we get into nature and we're connected to it, but we kind of have this like reckless abandon, right? So it's like, all right, look at this lizard. So I'm going to grab it and I'm going to take it inside. And I'm going to like shove it in this, you know, Tupperware or whatever. And we're kind of connecting, but we don't really know all of the right things to do. Um, so, you know, she talks here about how she like found this lizard and then she's like, oh, I definitely want to keep it. And of course, like the lizard died and like the eggs died. So being out in nature with kids and and letting them have that opportunity to go and like explore and touch and smell and and even kind of pick at things and then having that gentle guidance of having conversations about why we don't take these particular things inside and why we don't go and pick all of the leaves off of these particular um, shrubs or flowers and things like that so being able to kind of have that fine line of getting kids outdoors and having that gentle guidance of kind of leading them or helping them understand that our connection kind of comes with boundaries. Here's another example. Uh, I've taken kids and, and worked with Galveston Bay Foundation, done some like saning with the kids. This is literally one of their favorite things to do, finding all of the the stuff in the, the staining net. And of course, you know, the sea snots and, and uh, all the little silver sides and things like that. They absolutely adored it. Um, but again, you know, sometimes kids, they want to grab stuff and like squish it. So it's an opportunity for us to talk about, all right, let's look at it. But then, you know, we got to put it back in the water. Um, really talking to them again about their impact. So we're looking at water quality in the bay. We're putting in marsh grasses. I taught a birding mini course. Also, Cindy Metters taught a class with me, and it was a junior uh, naturalist, junior master naturalist class. And so, you know, we taught the kids about how to bird and how to do IDs and, and, and amazing things like that. So, again, just, you know, just showing you the impact of these kids. And, and like I said, I know that they seem scary, but watching these kids out in nature is one of the most amazing things that, that you can do and knowing that they are making connections with nature. And it's not that they're all gonna go into some conservation a job or whatever uh, in the future, but again, it's a memory that they will, they will hold onto and can connect with. So here we are at Exploration Green, you know, separating some of our wet and plants. Uh, that next picture, my dad actually was kind of breaking off some salt wart for the kids and they were um, eating it out there um, at the state park. And then our kids down here at the bottom are finding, you know, caterpillars, monarchs on our tropical milkweed, you know, just those kinds of things, talking to them about how to hold things and, you know, when you should hold things and when you shouldn't but allowing them to be connected with nature and talking to them about tropical milkweed, right? So the fact that like it attracts a lot of butterflies, but we still have to cut it down, you know, at this time. And, and it's, a good, it's a good segue to talk about those um, environmental practices once they start connecting with nature. And then of course, the last one, again, like looking at the refractometer, learning about, you know, scientific instruments, really, really a great thing. So. This quote was uh, from Jaime Gonzalez when uh, he was originally with uh, KPC. He's now with Nature Conservancy. 
he helped me a lot in getting a lot of ideas and uh, what to work with as far as establishing a tall coastal prairie. So we are one of the few schools, I mean, they're, they're growing, which is so fantastic, but we're one of the few schools that have a uh, tall coastal prairie. And I think in CCISD, we might be the only school that has um, a pocket prairie of tall coastal prairie plants. So it's, it's really neat to watch that grow and be able to take kids out uh, to look at that. So uh, here's Jim, always a big help. He's come out to the school numerous times, brought us um, a lot of plants that they had propagated. And then some people from Katy Prairie Conservancy came out and, and brought us some plants. So again, you know, here are the kids being a part of protecting this ecosystem that is dwindling, right? And learning that they're a part of something bigger. So this was our prairie, you know, the little, we had stuff flagged and I mean, the prairie plants were very, very small. But again, you can see like we're involved. We're not in our phones. We don't have to be in our computers. You know, learning how to use shovels, getting our hands dirty, like all of those great things. And this is our prairie now. So on the left-hand side, this was our uh, tall coastal prairie uh, that we had as of last year. And unbeknownst to me, I had a student that I taught who became very passionate about the class and the habitat. And so he wanted to do his Eagle Scout project in the habitat to help with conservation of the tall coastal prairie. And it kind of blew my mind because I really didn't have any idea that he was so engaged. So basically his Eagle Scout group came in and built this really amazing structure around the tall coastal prairie to help protect it because that is one of the things that's very, very difficult is to try to maintain a schoolyard habitat with also kind of going up against the maintenance um, group. Uh, that can be really, really difficult because, you know, they don't realize that you have an endangered ecosystem right there on your school grounds. And so, you know, the weed eater comes really quickly and the, the mowers come really fast. So this was really something that's been extremely beneficial to us. And just knowing that he connected with, you know, this habitat, you know, that he became part of it. So Joel Salatin is... He's one of my favorite farmers. I actually show groups of kids Food Inc., which I know the movie's kind of old, but basically understanding our connection to our food system is very important. And the fact that kids like literally have no idea that when they're eating vegetables, the limited amount that they eat, like how it grows and where it comes from, right? Because they just go into a store and then it's in the grocery cart or it just comes home. So this is so amazing for kids to start plants from seeds or start them from very, very small uh, plants and to harvest. And then um, we usually every year have enough for us to eat numerous times, as well as harvest clean. And now we're selling some of our produce to our staff. So that's been really fun as well. So basically like looking at our food system and how we're connected to our food system and looking at food systems that, you know, are hand grown by small groups of people versus like factory farms. And we have these conversations um, in class. So it's, it's good for them to understand because they are ingrained in that and they're not making their own choices for buying um, food, but they definitely will be. So it's good to kind of give them that, that heads up. So one of the things that I, I really like to talk about with my kids is environmentalism is not just about the environment and, and, and the nature part because we are involved in that. So intersectional environmental, environmentalism looks at the fact that when we start to create environmentally appropriate ecosystems, clean water, healthy soils, good air quality, it is the protection of people and especially marginalized communities that are the ones who are dealing the most with poor water quality, poor air quality, you know, food swamps, not having um, access to the biodiverse um, food systems that, that other groups have. So the fact that we are learning about 
how nature's connected with other humans and how when we start to make better choices with how we buy things and how we purchase and how we take care of the planet, how it brings about social justices and more equality with people across the planet. So that's, that's something that I like to talk about with kids as well. And climate change, especially, right? Because we know that marginalized communities are the ones that are most affected by, by climate change. So it's a great opportunity to kind of talk about that and find out how we're all connected. So I, I took a group, uh, I took a few groups actually to Costa Rica and I used a Costa Rican based uh, company. It was not a US based company because I wanted profits to stay in Costa Rica. And one of the things I really wanted to make sure of is that we tried to make connections to the culture um, and to kind of what was going on and not make it super touristy. I mean, clearly we were tourists, but we worked on organic strawberry farms. We stayed with Costa Rican peoples, uh, worked in, on their pineapple farms. We visited indigenous groups, the Bribri in Costa Rica. We toured cacao farms, learned about not only how chocolate was made, but what is the impact of the chocolate that we buy on these indigenous groups? So the, these experiences, I took my daughter on these experiences with me and what the kids took away from this is just overwhelming. We got together at the end of the trip and most of the kids had so many amazing things to say about their empathy and their passion for like wanting to make change and wanting to make a difference. And you know, you can see we're, we're working on an organic farm at the bottom of Volcano. We did sea turtle patrols. We stayed in these little small huts and our showers were rainwater. And I mean, these were really great things to have middle and high schoolers participating in to take a break from the technology and the social media and really interact not only with the planet, but also a lot of other amazing people um, that they are directly tied to, okay, with, with the things that they purchase. So one of the students that I took to Costa Rica that I taught in the seventh grade wrote this about her trip to Costa Rica and how it changed her life and how it changed her, her path. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a minute to read that because it's, it's pretty amazing. So this just goes to show that the impact that we have on kids, I don't think we realize how often it, it can change their lives and lead them down the path that, you know, is going to impact future generations. So after her trip, she now goes to war-torn countries and helps with disasters and things like that. Uh, and when she comes into town, we, we go out to lunch and it's just an amazing thing to, you know, to remember her as a, as a little silly 12 year old um, and, and turn into this amazing woman who was out there just creating a lot of positive change. So the last thing, of course, I have to end with the cutest little guy who it's just been such a pleasure to expose him to nature as much as I possibly can. So we all know this quote, but basically just kind of to kind of get him out there touching, feeling, smelling. I'm just going to end with this quote from Rachel Carson, just talking about getting kids emotionally attached to nature before really trying to get them to pinpoint what is the name of this plant? What is the name of this bird? But causing that emotional connection with nature. I just want to show you just like the excitement, right? The excitement that we see in younger people when they discover something new. So that's it for me. I appreciate you guys so much for having me. 
thank you, Tiffany. There are quite a few questions about parents and families participating, including how do you incorporate the families, the parents, and are they supportive or do you have parents that are hesitant? And uh, what are the impacts on the families? And also one person asked why, how the students get selected for the international. So that whole business of the parents and the family and how they're incorporated into your work. So all of the field trips that we go on, um, you know, I'm like, who wants to be a chaperone? Who would like to go, right? Now, middle school is kind of a funny age because in middle school, this is where kids start to kind of separate from their parents, right? And so there's sometimes our conversations about like, oh, it's so uncool if you go on the trip and like, you're the mom that's on the trip and I'm trying to be with my friends on this trip. So in some cases, I will have parents and, and I welcome any parent that wants to go, I have parents that are like, you know what, put me in a different group than my kid because I want to experience this. So parents are allowed to go and chaperone and be involved. And I actually tell my parents, if you are going to chaperone, you will be getting dirty, getting wet. Like I need you involved in the activities. Do you have meetings with the parents like at the beginning of the class so that they know? So, I mean, we have like an open house, but I do send out a syllabus and I Sometimes we'll record like the things that we'll be doing in class. I talk to them about like, we'll be going outside a lot. So make sure that your child always dresses for the weather. They need to have shoes that can get muddy. They need to have um, a shirt, you know, like a backup shirt. So if their shirt gets dirty or whatever, they can change. But the kids kind of know what they're signing up for. They see the kids on the campus, like working outside when they go outside for like PE or whatever, they see them doing the recycling program. So they kind of know, cause sixth graders don't take this course, only seventh and eighth graders. So they kind of see what's going on with this class. Something that's come up, I think in our chapter meeting with, with these programs and you developed this prairie and, and this question uh, applies to a lot of people that are working in school systems. How do you maintain like the profit Pocket Prairie, I mean, that has to be, you know, every year you have to do work in those those gardens and the prairies and how do you, what is your process for doing that? So I would say that the Pocket Prairie for me is not as hard to maintain as like all of the individual gardens because when we first started the, the Pocket Prairie, we put in um, a lot of the larger tall coastal grasses and, and some of the forbs. And it's just amazing how they've kind of taken over. Now, I will from time to time get my kids over there to kind of pull out the San Augustine that is wanting to take over. And I will, um, once a year, I usually will try to, well, every other year, maybe now, I cut the grasses down. When it was very small, I actually burned a little bit of the prairie, but it's gotten kind of big and it's kind of frowned upon for me to start fires on the campus. But the gardens, I mean, I have the kids, I, I basically have the kids do everything. I mean, they weed, they mulch, they plant, they start seeds. The summertime is really the only time that it gets a little out of control. But when the kids come back in August, that's the first thing we do. We're pulling weeds and we're talking about the impact of them and, and those kinds of things. So it's not just, it's not just me out there because I, I definitely couldn't do it by myself. Okay. And then, you know, you have uh, some pictures of dunes and how you were doing that. And I guess the person wanted to know how you arranged to do that. How do you arrange to work with these different organizations? So I had some connections with Galveston Bay Foundation. Uh, some people that I knew work for Galveston Bay Foundation. They were friends of mine. And so, you know, they could connect me with this person, that person. And and normally what I do is, you know, I email like the education person there. Uh, Galveston Bay Foundation, in the last couple of years, they've, they've changed some of their programming. So some things are different as far as kind of, kind of getting in there because a lot of these organizations were um, being supported by grants and the grants that they wrote. So they were wanting other groups to come in and you know collect data for those kinds of things so normally I am the one who who reaches out to these organizations to find ways that we can um, do work like 
I talk to Christy over here at Exploration Green. I'll talk to George Kayami over here uh, with the with the tree stuff at Exploration Green. Um, and I just kind of put out my feelers and and you know see if they're they're okay with me bringing middle schoolers. And I would say most of the time they are. But yeah, I mean mostly it's me finding out you know doing outreach myself to try to find these organizations. Yeah, I guess you know the, if you don't know people, you just cold call. I do. I mean, I usually will, you know, there's usually a website, so I will find like their education uh, person, or if they don't really have that, then I will say, oh, this is what I'm really interested. In. Who can I get in contact with? Well, so I've having, done that with quite a few groups. We're having people signing off now. So I had uh, one more question when that was, how do you select the students for the international? If you could do that in just a minute, and then there are people, if you want to look at the chat, there are people Thanking you very much for such a good program. Oh, thank you. So when I took kids to Costa Rica, um, it, it was open to whoever wanted to go. But again, you know, going to Costa Rica costs a certain amount of money. Um, and, you know, it's this certain time during the summer and things like that. So it, I didn't have to like hand select anyone. I offered it up to everyone at the school. And whoever was able to, um, you know, go on the trip as far as like the price and uh, the time constraints and, and, that, and that knew that this wasn't like a sunbathing kind of expedition. I mean, we, we got dirty and we were sweaty and, and did, you know, ate things that people had never eaten. And so, yes. The, uh, the comments that are coming in as we, we have to sign off here are inspiring, enthusiastic, you know, Aww. wonderful presentation. So uh, lots of people are making really, uh, really nice comments about your presentation. So thank you so, so much. And on the back and telling you thanks so much for giving this presentation uh, to our chapter. And um, me wanted me to make sure that the chapter members know that maybe when we get out of this COVID mess that we'll be able to to interact with you more yes. uh, in detail about the plants and, and our ideas too. So maybe we could have more. I would love that. I would love to have an opportunity to have you guys come and like work with my kids or just kind of come and look at the habitat. And yeah, absolutely. I think you'll have some volunteers. Put those hands dirty, everybody. Yes. <laughs>